Today's seminar is going to be broken up into three sections, as SK pointed out. I don't know how precise I'll be on the times he had, but we're generally going to do a section on behavior of structures. And then we're going to cover the code requirements for strut and tie modeling and how to develop your model. And then we're going to do an example and a summary of kind of higher end topics. Let's start with the kind of the crawl before we even walk or run. We all understand shear. We learned it heavily in school. What we have here up on the screen is a piece of wood modeling a continuous concrete beam. We have a hook on it where we can apply some load. But we've done something interesting. We have saw cut along this black line a crack. I completely broke the piece into two pieces, put a little hinge on the top of the compression zone. And then we've also drilled a hole vertically through this piece of wood and threaded a bungee cord through there, mimicking a stirrup with a knot on the top and a knot on the bottom. And it's symmetric about the center line at this location at the point of the load. So what happens if we apply load on this type of structure, mimicking a concrete beam with a pre-existing crack. Well, it's able to carry load. As we apply load to it, the crack opens up, but that stretches the bungee cord. And this type of philosophy is a great way just to even think about, not even talking about strut and tie, but how do stirrups work? They keep the clacks closed, but more importantly, they have to stretch to do that, which is one of the reasons why you must anchor stirrups at the top and the bottom. You can't just have a U without a hook at the top or something of that nature, because they have to be anchored on each side of the crack. But what is really happening in this situation? Well, this is really a strut and tie. Even though we've never historically called it this, it has always been this type of condition. Um, Give you just a little bit of nomenclature. Generally, a red solid line implies tension. A green and or dashed line implied compression. So what we have here is the load coming down as a tension coming up the element. Comes up here, and it comes down diagonally inside the concrete and compression, or in this case, the wood. But it's a compression force. And then it comes up the stirrup, or in this case, the bungee cord, and then comes back down diagonally to the point of support. So even though we've never thought about just basic flexure and basic shear as strut and tie, in reality, it actually is behaving that way. A um, couple things that are in the code that kind of get us our nomenclature going forth. A lot of times people think of Oh, strut and tie, that's just for deep beams. Actually, that's false, but it's a good starting point. Um, strut and tie is a holistic method that can be used for any type of structures, but it is primarily used for a deep beam type element. And so in ACI 318, specifically 11, they've come up with a consistent definition for deep beams, and that's where the span, clear span, is less than four times the height of the beam, such that these struts and ties may develop. So the code has a very simple line in it that says deep beam shall be designed either by taking into account nonlinear distribution of strain or by Appendix A. Well, I don't know about you, but I do not have a nonlinear distribution of strain finite element software on my desktop. A lot of universities do not have those type of tools. So even though two options are given in the code, the really only option for these deep, deep beams with the span to depth ratio of four is to go to Appendix A. And you're going to say, oh, well, I've always designed deep beams by this cookbook method that's in the code. That, occur, that was in the code in the 99 code and prior editions. 
but between the 99 code and the 02 code, that entire section was voted out of the code and replaced by that section we just quoted where you have the two options.